was on the plane.
Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm really excited to have an opportunity again to, um, at least this time, introduce myself. Um, since I didn't do that this <laughs> earlier today. Um, I'm Eileen Stansberry. I'm the chief scientist at NASA's Johnson Space Center. I also introduce my uh, co-sponsor, Louise Proctor, director of the Lunar Planetary Institute. Uh, welcome to NASA Night. Um, we've had an exciting uh, day so far, uh, some incredible, interesting talks, and the whole week is chock full of interesting science. And I'd like to take just a couple of moments uh, to celebrate uh, the contributions uh, uh, to our uh, field by some very special um, scientists. Okay, it's my great pleasure to start off this evening's uh, uh, NASA briefings w by introducing John Guidi, the Deputy Director of the Advanced Exploration Systems. Well, thanks. Good evening. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm the Deputy Director of Advanced Exploration Systems. We sort of have a cool job at NASA. I'm out of NASA headquarters. Uh, our office gets to do a lot of different things. Um, other than SLS Orion, which are done by the major program offices, we get to think about what's next, what's happening now, uh, what should we be doing 10 years, 20, 30 years from now, and what should we be doing to, today to prepare. So that's what we get to do. So I'm gonna uh, share with you some, some more recent changes in human spaceflight planning, uh, particularly that related to lunar activities. I'll go through it pretty quickly. Um, I'll spend a little bit of detail on some gateway activities that uh, we've been uh, brewing up, uh, uh, putting a lot of heat under lately, and, and you'll see why we're doing that. So uh, for those of you not familiar with it, uh, there's a national space policy in the US. It's almost 80 pages. Uh, we had a new president whose job it is to review that policy and change things. All he decided to change was the yellow lettering that you see there on the screen. And that, that yellow lettering is very important and it has a lot of uh, implications for the way NASA does business. And that's going back uh, to leading a return to the humans to the moon, which is really important for us. Um, in the world of DC politics, slides like this and, and PowerPoint and everything is pretty important. So I want to take you on a brief history of how quickly uh, things have changed. If you were at this uh, last year, and certainly two years ago, you probably saw, maybe you didn't, but there we go. A chart like this, we called it Journey to Mars. It encapsulated our exploration policy. We're big moon, a uh, bunch of spacecraft going to Mars, some already there, but, I'm, I'm sorry, big Earth, a bunch of spacecraft going. 
Uh, Mars is big itself. The moon is a little tiny part. We sort of suggest we're going to go by there and, and get things done, but it's not really that, uh, not really that prominent. So after the elections, we start getting wind of how uh, Washington, D.C. was going to change in space policy, and we generated a new chart. And now you see it's a bigger uh, moon, smaller Mars, smaller Earth, and moons uh, more central, because we, we're, we're pretty sure that's where we we're headed. And that was the policy from last year. Now, over the past few months, we've uh, finished up our budget cycle, at least on the presidential side of the budget cycle. You all are familiar with, now it goes to Congress, and they actually put money where, uh, where we propose to put it. That hasn't happened yet, but generally they support NASA, especially human exploration, pretty well. Sometimes they give us a little extra money. So, so things are moving along. So from this chart, now we have the new space policy. <laughs> Sort of tells that Moon is front and center, a lot of things happen in there. Mars is still the ultimate goal. We're not abandoning Mars at all. We still want to get there, but we're just going to make Moon a bigger part of the plan forward. Um, so translating that policy and those PowerPoints into budget, here's an actual summary of the presidential budget submit. You'll see the items in uh, red highlight uh, the activities related to the moon, there's $10.5 billion related to exploring the moon, putting uh, humans back there. Uh, there's another part where they approve the lunar orbital gateway, um, lunar orbital platform gateway. It's a horrible name, but I'm sure it's, uh, it was a compromise of some sort. I'm sure we'll change it later on. Uh, we also want to develop a series of more capable robotic missions going to the lunar surface, and it references the fact that SLS and Orion will be returning to the moon. So if you take that and map it into some sort of plan to execute, you come up with our exploration campaign. This is fairly new. Uh, past month or two, it's, it's come up. Uh, the top line you see there, the green one, is actually reflecting. Those little vertical hashes re reflect launches. The, the wide ones are big launches. Middle ones are smaller, and the, and the, the thin lines are, are smallest launches. But all of those represent missions related to the moon and going to the moon. It's divided into four areas, and this is a combined effort with the Science Mission Directorate and the Human Exploration Mission Directorate, and also our Technology Mission Directorate. We're looking at how we can uh, uh, change things there to help everybody. But it's a combined plan to, uh, to get back to the moon as quickly as possible, starting small, working big. The first item you see there is the, uh, let's see, there we go, Early Science and Technology Initiative. You'll see uh, the the title here, SMD in bold, they're in charge of this activity and they're going to open some pristine Apollo samples, work with uh, Survey Virtual Institute on that. Uh, HEOMD and Science are working together on CubeSats, I'll tell you a little bit about that in a few minutes. And SMD is leading our science and technology payload development uh, in technology areas. SMD is also working in small commercial lander activities. Uh, they have a uh, small commercial lander payload plan coming up soon. helomb has been doing that for a while. We're interested in the moon because it has a lot of, we assume, we think it has a lot of polar volatiles that'll be useful for human exploration. Learn how to handle them on the moon and then go on to Mars. So we've had a couple of projects in the works for a year or two. Uh, trying to enhance our commercial capabilities with small landers and also the technology activities. SMD is going to take over that role and improve it to where we have a really robust small landing capability. I'm sure Jim will mention that a little bit later. Uh, HEOMD is going to look at the mid to larger lander uh, capabilities. Ultimately, we want to uh, find out early what we can do with, uh, say, 500 to 1,000 kilogram uh, class landing systems on the moon and how we can grow those to human class landers uh, by the latter half of the next decade. So it, it's pretty aggressive. It will take some money. I'll tell you how we think we can uh, uh, try to fund it. Um, one other thing I want to mention is Lunar Orbital Platform Gateway. I'll just call it the Gateway. Uh, we've been working on that for a few years, too, and now they gave us the formal authority to, to proceed with that. Uh, we've got um, some work in there. I'll go ahead and elaborate on that a little bit. There we go. Uh, some other items in that budget summary uh, related to low Earth orbit. Uh, the nation is getting very capable. SpaceX, uh, Blue Origin, some other companies are doing some awesome job with uh, launching rockets, and we want to take advantage of it. So our budget has incentives to help grow that economy, especially grow the low Earth orbit economy and space station. We're interested in transitioning ownership and operation of the space station over to the private sector, and that's because we can take the money and start investing it into beyond low Earth orbit activities, notably around the moon. 
Uh, we think maybe by 2025 we'll have that uh, capability enabled. It's uh, difficult because companies can only uh, find lucrative markets when they're available and we need to figure out how to develop those in some clever ways. There's also a little bit of seed money for encouraging some other activities in low Earth orbit. So, but let me go ahead and move on to uh, deep space activities. Uh, folks probably know about the SLS launch vehicle and Orion spacecraft and the ground operations associated with it. First mission is planned for the middle of 2020. It's called Exploration Mission 1. Uh, it's kind of a busy graphic. It'll be uncrewed, 25 days long. But uh, what's uh, important to note is we're bringing up 13 CubeSats, which are getting much more capable every day. Uh, a few of those are related to lunar activities. So you can see on this slide, a list of the 13 CubeSats, and you'll see the uh, ICPS ejecting those CubeSats at three different points along near Earth on the transit to uh, the moon and also near the moon. EM2 is the second launch of the SLS Orion system. It will be crewed for only nine days or so, uh, but that crew will not be bringing up uh, CubeSats at this point, but it does have a fairly robust co-manifest capability. So in addition to the Orion capsule, we have a capable uh, six to nine metric tons, and we want to use that capability to start assembling the gateway. And this is planned for uh, 2023. So a little bit more on the gateway. Um, I should point out that this, this is an artist's conception of what a gateway looks like. There's, our engineering is nowhere near it. It's not meant to hint at any particular vendor or company at all. It's just something the artist came up with. You can see it's uh, pretty small compared to Orion. Uh, the gateway is planned to only be about 10% habitable volume of the space station, so that's, that's pretty small. Uh, it has a few parts to it. The gold part is the power propulsion element. It'll probably be the first thing in space. All it does is provide solar electric power, some communications capabilities, and power to the rest of the system when it gets there. The other elements you see there, habitation, uh, airlock, uh, docking capabilities, and a, a robotic arm can go up in different sequences. We're not really sure of how the, the right sequence at this point, but we're looking at a few different ways of doing that. So this is, a, again, an artist's conception, what we think it'll look like. Um, so the, the basic function of the gateway, when Orion docks to it, it will get at least a month of time, probably two months, and I'm hearing folks in the community talk about if we do things right, maybe we'll get up to three months of habitation capability for the crew when they get up there. That's a pretty long time. Uh, SLS is only planned to launch once a month, so for two or three months we'll have a crew on board. The rest of the time it's automated, uh, operating 24 hours a day. Uh, I mentioned the airlock already. A lot of that has to do with uh, driving science requirements. Uh, it's fairly small, only 80 centimeters. may not make sense for some instruments, but we think it's a, it makes sense for the large majority at this point. They'll have logistics module capability, not just government, but we want commercial entities to go up there. And dock, they can bring science up, they can bring science back in addition to supplies for their, their own vehicles. Or <clears throat> I should have mentioned the, uh, we're building the gateway, trying to use international standards on building it. So any country and any company can dock to the gateway at some point in the future. We hope that'll lower costs and also encourage more commercial activities. Um, so the reason why I tried to be uh, clear about the artist's conception is uh, for the past few years we've had a few companies under, under contract uh, coming up with their own concepts for what a gateway should look like. Uh, we did not give them any requirements, just said we want something up there, keeps the crew alive, here's the basic functions, so what would you build? And so we have a lot of smart folks and some domestic companies uh, looking at that. They came up with concepts and then we moved them to the second stage and they're actually building ground prototypes of all of those. Uh, concepts in different parts of the U.S. We even have one that's looking at uh, you know, breaking into a used rocket stage and converting that to a habitable volume. Um, this is actually happen happening in parallel. Uh, we've been working with the international partners on the ISS to come up with their own versions of a gateway. So all this is happening at the same time. So there's a lot of dynamic um, draft requirements, ground rules, assumptions in effect. We still haven't uh, solidified what that might be. We think maybe later this year we'll understand things enough kind of pick the best concepts of all those, uh, all those companies and, and figure out what the requirements might be for a gateway. Um, the first element, uh, which is going up, the PPE, has actually been around quite a long time. You might remember in uh, the, the technology mission directorate at NASA, quite a few years ago, they were building a high-power solar electric propulsion system 
just to test technologies. And we figured, well, why not put a payload package on the front, go to an asteroid, take a sample, bring it back. Uh, that matured for a while, um, didn't really have the support it needed, so now we're back to just the, uh, the power propulsion element itself. Uh, we actually have uh, companies on contract with us giving us their own concepts. We're trying to leverage uh, communication satellites, which have a large uh, number, large high power system capability, and we want to use those in order to uh, decrease our costs. Don't want to say too much more about this. Uh, it's uh, advanced to the point where next month we're going to release an RFP to the community to, uh, for responses. So what are we going to do when we get there? One of the things we learned from ISS is rather than design it first, get it working, and then figure out how to use it, it's not as beneficial to the, the, the community as it could be. So we're trying to do both right now at the same time. Uh, myself and a few other folks in this room are on a team that's trying to help the utilization requirements, driving it into the design of the gateway itself. Uh, for us, it means stakeholders, and this community is certainly the major stakeholder of a gateway. Uh, the longer you're happy, the longer that program flies, and that's, that's good for both of us. Uh, it's also cheaper to put your requirements in the early design phase rather than add it later on. We think there's uh, four areas for utilization, technologies, not just uh, improving what we have now to make the gateway work, maybe test technologies for uh, future landing systems or future transport systems to Mars. Uh, we'll have an RFI coming out a little bit later if uh, folks are interested in seeing that, uh, probably next month on getting non-NASA ideas what the uh, technology aspects of the gateway might be. On the commercial side, we know that those contractors I pointed out that were building ground prototypes have their own ideas for uh, commercial activities on board a gateway separate from NASA. And uh, we understand that, that that's great, that's what we want, so we'll have an RFI, maybe collect some of the things that they'd be willing to share with NASA um, probably next month as well, a lot of RFIs coming out. On the international front, I mentioned we're working with our international partners on the space station. Uh, that's been going on for a few years. Probably not much more we'll see in utilization from that area, aside from international science. Uh, this is more of the hardware activities. And lastly, but probably most importantly, is the science and research activities. Um, we, we wanted to jump on this pretty quickly. Uh, HEOMD, uh, Human Exploration, and the Science Mission Director joined forces. The two gentlemen down here on this end uh, set up a workshop in Denver, and that was intended to capture early science requirements of a gateway. It had three goals. Share what a gateway was with the science community. Find out what they could do at a gateway, science related. Understand the resources that were needed to do that and then understand what those resources meant to designing a gateway to fulfill those requirements. We think it was pretty successful, pretty happy with it. We've briefed it to, a, to a management so far. We're going back to the science mission directorate uh, management to, to share our findings uh, pretty soon. Just a, a quick note about the workshop. It was fairly fast paced, only two and a half days overall. We had a few opening, uh, the morning we spent opening some context setting presentations. And then we had a almost 180 abstracts presented by scientists, five to 10, five, 20 minutes each in five different disciplines that are, that are listed there. Um, and they each said, here's what I could do with a gateway as I, as I envision it and as, as you described it, and here's the sort of resources I need. We had engineers, gateway engineers in those meetings and scientists who worked together to capture all that. And we spent the last part of the workshop feeding back what we heard in the areas, uh, five areas you see there, orbits, human exploration, future uh, capabilities, et cetera. Fed that back to the same scientists, said here's what we think we, we heard from you and here's what it means to us. And we also had gateway leadership there. So again, this is trying to design this particular gateway to fulfill the needs of stakeholders so we have a long-term program. There are a few, quite a few takeaways from it. Um, I thought it might be of interest to go through them pretty quickly. The first one is the robotic arm putting experiments on the outside of the gateway it doesn't come up until the latter flights. So we recognize that's a problem. That's what we really need to uh, get science from a gateway. So as a result of that, uh, Ben met with the uh, project management team for the power propulsion element who's coming out with an RFP next month and said, hey, look, you have an opportunity to get early science, recognizing the PPE isn't designed to fulfill uh, fly science experiments, but it does have robotic arm attachment points, which you could put passive or small experiments on and see if we get some science back while it's flying up there and waiting for uh, the next exploration mission to, to build it up. And they said, we love it. Let's go look into it. 
We don't know if there'll be uh, capability there. We don't know about launch loads on the PPE, but that might be a science opportunity you'll hear advertised pretty soon. A second takeaway was the near rectilinear halo orbit. And that's basically if you're on the Earth looking at the moon, uh, you'll just see the orbit of the gateway going around. It's planar to you. That's the rectilinear part. Uh, we sort of felt that maybe not everybody would be happy with that, but we were surprised to learn that a number of disciplines came forth and said, no, that's the right distance, it's the perfect uh, orbit for the type of science I need, and they went through and explained that. Uh, it was pretty apparent that the Gateway, while it could provide science, it does need a little bit of enhancements to really fulfill the goals of lunar science, particularly a free flyer payload. Um, there's a lot of pointing uh, concerns and, and uh, the ability to, to get a long look at the lunar surface, and whereas the gateway is uh, kind of trying to point toward the sun for solar panel uh, uh, alignment. So we, uh, Ben again, went to HEO, or my management, and said, hey, look, we need to think about a free flyer. Do you mind if we study this? And they said, that's the right answer. Let's go ahead and do that. So that's a great opportunity, too. That's probably... Uh, not as mature or as early as uh, listening to what might fly on the PPE. It's still more conceptual phase, but uh, something that might be coming down the road. A couple other takeaways. Uh, a lot of sampling from a variety of disciplines could be had on the gateway. And the radiation environments outside the Van Allen belts, you have the ISS inside, both are microgravity. Maybe you could do dual experiments in each location on Earth. There's some things you could do. You're passing in and out of the Earth's magnetosphere uh, during the you know, lunar orbits. So it's, it, it could be a lot of good science, and, and we heard a lot of uh, folks uh, reflect that. So more on the engineering side, I'll, I'll, go, I'll, I'll try to speed up a little bit. Um, I already noted that the, uh, a lot of payloads want to look at something for a long time. Gateway doesn't really allow that, so maybe we need to look, look at steerable, tiltable platforms or free flyer. Uh, a lot of the experiments did not want to come through the uh, habitable portion and be contaminated, potentially contaminated. They wanted delivery straight from a, say, logistics element or the Orion and go right on the outside of the PPE. Um, there was a lot of questions about internal analysis. Uh, we had originally thought that uh, scientists might want to have samples untouched and sent straight back to Earth for analysis on the Earth. It turned out not to be the case. Um, they really wanted some onboard science activities. It almost suggests we need more science volume than we were originally planning. Uh, with the Gateway uncrewed two-thirds of the time at least, there's a large need for automation. A lot of scientists are, uh, uh, indicated they need some robotic assists on their experiments. We understood that. We've also heard concepts for internal and external robotics and some robotic systems that could take payloads out and uh, bring them back through the science airlock remotely. Uh, we heard that uh, a lot of the, the science community could use a lot of data. Some of the experiments are the ter terabits a day. Um, surprised us. So that allowed us to go back to the design teams and say, we need, a, we need to think about a separate payload bus, separate payload data bus, and a separate payload computer, maybe sorting through some of the data early on so we don't have to downlink it all. And they said, OK, that's the right answer. Let's go look at it. Uh, we were reminded the far sides are RF silent. Try to keep it that way. There's some good science that can happen, and we need to manage our RF uh, uh, noise on the gateway as we go through. I already mentioned contamination concerns for payloads going inside. They also talked about the exosphere around the uh, gateway. And also, if you just improved a few of the gateway generic capabilities, there's a clock on board. We know where it is. If you can improve the precision, either with atomic clocks or one meter accuracy in locating, you can do some other incredible science, too. All right, good information. Um, lastly, this we're reminded again, the gateway is not the, um, all the answers for uh, uh, achieving great lunar science. We need some auxiliary uh, payloads or capabilities to do that. Uh, there were a couple other activities that, that or discussion areas that we talked about. Lunar and planetary science, there's a bit of a summary uh, here. Um, lunar remote sensing, CubeSats, ejecting them either from the gateway or maybe from a free flyer at the right at altitude location. Um, we talked about telerobotics either on board or using the gateway as a path through for a telerobotics capability here on Earth, uh, looking at uh, NEOs and deploying surface instrumentation. This is, this is where the small lander comes up and it folds nicely in with the, the larger exploration plans that NASA's uh, doing. <clears throat> we spent some time talking about sample activities as well. Um, there's a, quite a few things that came up. It became more important than we thought it would be, so we have to invest in 
Uh, how we do that, exosphere contamination management, a lot of other things. We talked about building a boom to stay away from the spacecraft if it's uh, giving off uh, contaminants. I uh, don't know if that will come to fruition, but um, uh, we, it was certainly an idea that we, we hadn't thought of, and Slipshra came up with a lot of areas for uh, a biological work on the gateway as well. Let's see. All right. Um, there are a few other things he and is working on, lunar-related. Uh, one of them, uh, South Korea is uh, sending an orbiter around the moon in 2020, in December of 2020. Uh, they gave us instrument space in return for uh, some of our deep space network time and some of our uh, uh, flight design navigation expertise. Uh, really, we're just there to confirm their calculations, but they want to make sure uh, that the mission goes off without a hitch. Uh, Jim Green was kind enough to sponsor a participating scientist program for both their four instruments and our single instrument on board. Um, you should be seeing that perhaps next month we're refining uh, the ROSES uh, 18 Annex that should be released. The ROSES 18 already went out, but we should get something out uh, next month. We're thinking maybe five to ten scientists. It's a little bit earlier in the process than uh, normal, I understand. Uh, that's because South Koreans would like uh, NASA's assistance in the science area as well, and they specifically requested, can we get the assistance early? So you'll be seeing coming that, uh, that come out pretty soon. Uh, another item we're working on, a resource prospector. You've probably heard about that in the past. It's the, the lunar rover, um, notably looking for more volatile type activities that uh, he OMD is sponsoring. It's been, um, it's been maturing for a while, but right now we're reconsidering everything we're doing in, uh, at NASA, and we're not sure where right next step for resource prospect or how it fits in. So we're waiting for some additional management consideration and direction in uh, where it'll go in 19. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention, and was on our lunar exploration chart, um, the medium to large lander class, we just sent out an RFI on Friday, and that's to uh, get industry input on what their capabilities are. Those, there's some great capabilities that are maturing out there. We know certainly in the small area, and there's folks that have plans for larger landers. Uh, we hope to hear their ideas, how they're going to mature those into a human-sized lunar lander by, again, the, the latter part of the uh, next decade. Uh, ultimately, uh, we want to get somebody on contract in 19 and maybe have a small lander mission in 22 and a couple years later a little bit bigger payload on the surface. Don't know about the payload uh, capability right now, but stay tuned. I'm sure we'll be uh, sharing a lot more, probably an RFI, RFP, or, or other calls for our science experiments. So that's it. Uh, it's, it's kind of a lot of stuff we're doing aside from science and, and supporting their activities. So um, uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Um, we should probably just introduce the panel up here. So next to John on his right is Ben Bussey, who's the Chief Scientist of the Human Exploration Division. Um, Jonathan Rawl, sitting next to Jim Green, is the Planetary uh, Science and Research Director. And Michael New is the Deputy Associate Administrator for Research. And so I'm going to hand over now to Jim Green, the Planetary Science Division Director. Thank you very much, Louise. So what I'd like to do today is um, talk indeed about the planetary science uh, view going forward. Uh, first, I'll mention that there's quite a few people from NASA headquarters here. Uh, so um, let me just have them raise their hand. David, John, yeah. Oh, they're all up front. Yeah, this is great, yeah. So you'll have to, they, they're, they're ones that always come and sit in the front anyway, I guess. But indeed, um, uh, we, you have an excellent opportunity to talk to think people from our program, uh, uh, you know, in our R&D program or our missions program, and, and uh, so it's, a, it's a, an important opportunity to, uh, to get your questions answered. Uh, there's also a couple positions that we want to talk about that's very important to us. Uh, you know, the Planetary Data System Project Office at Goddard has announced a position. Uh, uh, that's now open. It's a permanent civil servant position. PDS is a critical element of our infrastructure. You can't do our RNA largely without uh, a strong uh, infrastructure and, and, uh, and, and uh, data management and archiving distribution. So uh, please take note of that. It's on USA Jobs. Now, in addition to that, uh, Yvonne Pendleton has uh, decided that she's going to go back to research. Uh, part of that is because she's been um, uh, very successful in, in uh, getting uh, to become part of teams on, 
on uh, getting access to JWST data. And so um, uh, we're going to be uh, putting out uh, 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 the new survey director announcement. Uh, it should come out shortly if it's, uh, uh, actually I think it, it did re get released today. I didn't check that, but it's open from 319 to 423. And here's the USA Jobs um, uh, announcement on that. And once again, I want to thank Yvonne for all the very hard work she's done. Is, is Yvonne here? I haven't seen her uh, yet today, but. But in any event, thank, Yvonne, thank you very, very much. She's not here, okay. Thank you very, very much. Um, uh, uh, she's done just an outstanding uh, work for us and, and she's gonna be around. Uh, we're gonna bring in the new director and um, uh, she'll be uh, doing a tag team. So thank you very much, Yvonne. All right, so what's happening in the next year or so, here's uh, sort of my traditional uh, planetary science mission events chart. This is uh, an exciting year. We've got several important milestones. Uh, of course, May the 5th, you know, Cinco de Mayo. We're gonna launch uh, InSight to Mars. It's going out of Vandenberg, not Kennedy. You know, so Vandenberg, you know, uh, points south, goes under the South Pole, uh, and then takes this radical left turn and heads out to Mars. Uh, the first time we've ever done that, so uh, we're, we're we're quite hopeful that that will work uh, ex extremely well and allow us then to potentially think about using Vandenberg for other, other planetary launches, we'll see. Uh, in the August time frame, OSIRIS-REx is going to get close enough that it's starting to make some observations of Bennu and it will really be in the, uh, later this year uh, beyond that that uh, uh, OREx will have uh, some spectacular observations of this 500 meter, meter or so carbonaceous chondrite. Uh, and then, of course, it's going to be in the area of uh, Bennu for quite a while. Uh, find a landing site, go down, acquire a sample, and bring that back. Now, we're involved in Bepi Colombo, so um, uh, in October, instead of launching JWST, Bepi Colombo actually has a planetary launch window, and uh, ESA will be launching um, Bepi Colombo. Uh, and, of course, that moves JWST's launch date, and it hasn't been announced when that will be. Uh, but um, uh, we're delighted to be part of that mission, and, it, and it's, uh, we'll go to Mercury and, and uh, get there about six or so years later. On uh, another great holiday, you know, November 26th, Thanksgiving, or close to it, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, land inside on Mars. And then, of course, we, we, we can't go out of the year without um, having another major event on a holiday. Uh, New Horizons is going to fly by. Uh, the uh, Kuiper Belt object, uh, formerly named MU-69, it's Ultima Thule. Okay, that's our informal name for it. And that was, uh, that, uh, that uh, was a nice contest that was ran worldwide. Thousands and thousands of entries and, and uh, that was certainly uh, one of the top ones that raised, uh, uh, came to our attention. It's a great name. Overall, planetary science is doing incredibly well. We have a suite of missions in, in all phases from formulation, implementation, primary operations, and extended missions. Our extended missions are really quite healthy. Uh, and um, uh, we have a number of things that we're looking forward to. We've had great cooperation with uh, uh, our international partners, and I'll talk a little bit more about that too. Uh, so let me uh, get right to the chase and go and tell you the news. And uh, everyone says, well, you know, Jim Green's always uh, positive, you know, always has this positive attitude. Uh, but uh, I want to show you our budget. Currently, we're at $1.8 billion, and the president's request starting for FY19 is $400 million higher with two new initiatives. Okay. This is uh, spectacular. Planetary science has never had this high a budget. Now, I've been at headquarters for approximately 12 years, and out of the four disciplines, you know, we always put in for new initiatives, and it might be that every year, every other year or so, we get a new initiative for one of the disciplines, and planetary science got two of them in one fiscal year, all right? And, the, and of course, the, the two really spectacular ones are uh, we, we now have a new line, Lunar Discovery and Exploration. As you can see, it will start at about $218 million. Uh, LRO will now be part of that line. We'll move that out of Discovery and put that into uh, 
uh, the Lunar Discovery and Exploration Program. And, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what some of the components of that new line is. In addition to that, uh, we've got an enormous upper in planetary defense. So planetary defense, uh, you know, many years ago when I, when I first came was running at about 4.5 or so million dollars and we gradually uh, worked our way up and we got all kinds of correct congressional direction and uh, not, uh, not uh, what I would call um, the funding necessary to execute that direction. Well, that's now starting to change. Uh, our program has been greatly enhanced and, and we go from 60 million this year to $150 million, okay? And uh, this, so this allows us to really step out and do a number of important things, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So we have um, a healthy program in RNA, and as you can see, it's uh, $230 million, and it's gonna bump up uh, to $258 million uh, next fiscal year. Uh, and then New Frontiers, this will allow us to execute our current program, uh, including the down select from New Frontiers 4, uh, Mars exploration, I'll talk a little bit more uh, about that. This allows us actually to launch uh, uh, Mars 2020, uh, which will begin the uh, era of sample return, and then we're working hard to create an overall program uh, for which we can bring the samples back, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then outer planets and, and ocean worlds, uh, does look like it went down a little while we did lose Cassini. Uh, but uh, Europa Clipper's doing great, and we'll, we'll be uh, uh, continuing on with that, and we have a lot of uh, important uh, activities and technologies that we're developing, uh, which also uh, obtained a, an increase. So this is really spectacular news, uh, and um, uh, the program is uh, uh, really quite solid in, in, uh, in many ways. So what's changed, as I mentioned, is indeed the two new initiatives, Lunar discovery and exploration, planetary defense. Uh, we're, we're working now towards developing that next step uh, in terms of bringing the samples back. Uh, once we create an overall program with our international partners, we'll be able to better estimate uh, costs and then lay that into the program. Uh, the uh, president's budget has Europa Clipper uh, launched as early as 2025. Last year, the Europa Clipper was um, uh, in the budget such that we could launch it in, uh, in, in uh, FY26. This budget allows us to pull that in an entire year, launch it in 2025. Uh, there's nothing in the president's budget, however, for uh, Europa Lander. Now, in addition to the uh, uh, moving uh, Clipper in one year, uh, the administration would like to have us uh, fly clipper on a commercial vehicle uh, since there is a cost savings between the two. But we do have congressional direction otherwise, so we'll have to work these things out as we go forward. Uh, and of course, what stayed the same is, uh, is the, the main basic program, Discovery, New Frontiers, uh, Generation of Plutonium-238 with DOE, and that's gone well, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the status of that program as it relates to uh, our missions. And then we're starting, indeed, uh, a healthy activity in the area of CubeSats and SmallSats. So if um, you were around yesterday and you had an opportunity to stop by, I know many of you did because the room was packed, uh, where we talked about our 19 or 20 concepts in CubeSats that we invested over the last year, a uh, lot of fantastic ideas, and, and um, uh, it tells us uh, that there's still a lot of work to do. We've got some technology hurdles to overcome in terms of, of um, uh, getting, getting our CubeSats to station, uh, not space station, but you know, where they need to go to make the observations, and communication along with power and, um, and, and other aspects of the technology. So we have to tackle some of those. Okay. Uh, John already mentioned the directive. I, I won't uh, uh, reread that or highlight it any more than that. But uh, this particular figure is a really good one. Talks about uh, the, the number of important elements in the program. The first part of this program is going to be some enhancements in our RNA program, and we're working on those right now. Uh, we have an opportunity to um, uh, do an enhanced analysis of some lunar samples that have not uh, been previously, previously analyzed. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, start that call this year. 
Uh, this will be, be important because we want to get ready to continue to do more sample analysis, and in particular, more sample analysis returns for, with return samples from the moon. Uh, we're also going to put out, put out a couple announcements of opportunity for uh, instruments, and uh, these are instruments that will go on commercial landers or, or perhaps an array of other uh, you know, international opportunities, potentially. Uh, we still have a uh, lot to work out in that area. But they'll come in two, two different waves. The first wave is uh, an early uh, AO for which we can get our instruments together in a rather short time period. This might be refurbishing an existing instrument uh, that's very applicable or something that's uh, 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 nearly in the state of uh, high level of readiness uh, that we're investing through our current uh, Matisse program and, and it just needs a little ump to be able to get there. This will be important to work with the, the commercial groups that are planning over the next year or two to go to the moon. Uh, we want to uh, make those connections and continue to be uh, partners with them as we move forward such that they can uh, get us to the moon. We're, we're looking at them as a, a, a providing services for us uh, in this particular area. Uh, so that's an important step. And then, of course, we're, we're interested in um, uh, the landers and rovers. Uh, we'll be investing in uh, concepts on uh, uh, small, long-lived landers. So we. We indeed are putting aside a little radioisotope power uh, such that we'll be using that uh, uh, for many of our uh, upcoming missions in, in, in indeed the lunar area. As John mentioned, the Gateway uh, is a big help to us. Uh, you know, our input into the uh, Gateway uh, conference that was held uh, most recently, as John pointed out, was indeed we we're quite interested in the Gateway providing uh, infrastructure capability for us. Uh, most importantly will be communication. The ability to have communication on anything that we put on the far side of the moon is just so enabling. It just blows open a, a region of, of, uh, of planetary uh, uh, exploration that we just haven't had the opportunity uh, to do in the past at, at the same level. That communication the Gateway could provide would allow us to do many, many different things, and so I think that's a really great step forward. And to get ready for some of those activities, we actually did a lunar site workshop in January. Survey uh, put that together for us and executed it. It was an outstanding workshop for many of those that uh, had the opportunity to come to that. Uh, our plan was uh, really to uh, uh, look at the moon and where we want to go for samples and the kind of samples we want to return. Uh, certain geological features that we wanted to explore that tell us about the history and origin of the moon or even the history of the sun uh, based on uh, uh, observations that we can get out of the regolith uh, over, uh, that's uh, occurred over billions of years. Uh, also uh, going to places where there are volatiles so uh, we were able to, I think, um, uh, have um, many of the vendors who were there make an important connection that will allow them to say, these are the locations on the moon that we can get to, these are the ones we want to go to, and, and therefore uh, we'll be uh, providing them uh, the associated experiments to be able to do the kind of science that we want to do. So this is a new step for NASA. You know, NASA's not really used to interacting with a commercial, at least SMD. Uh, with a commercial group as, as, uh, as much as a partner as we have with our international community, but uh, you know, we have uh, methods that we're going to use in the same way uh, to work with them, and uh, we really want to help jumpstart this, and we really want to help them get to the moon and, and continue on doing that uh, into the next, well into the next decade. Another thing the Gateway can provide potentially is a location for which we can get samples up to and then uh, they can be ferried back, uh, uh, back to Earth. So there's a number of those things that are being looked at and discussed. The second major initiative is uh, in the area of planetary defense. Uh, we have a spectacular op uh, opportunity to explore a particular area that we've wanted to for a long time, and that's in the area of mitigation. You know, uh, our program in uh, planetary defense has really been all about finding out what our near-Earth environment is like, looking for potentially hazardous asteroids, you know, cataloging the, the NEOs and understanding uh, as we roll their um, uh, orbits out well into the future, 
uh, if they are becoming a hazard, a hazard to, uh, uh, to us or not. Uh, so we've set up over the years a number of important uh, elements that make that uh, support happen from the ground-based observers to the analysis groups uh, through the Minor Planet Center. Uh, also, we've worked with the National Science Foundation and continue to uh, use Arecibo, uh, which we're delighted to see now Arecibo's uh, uh, pretty much back online, in fact, uh, after the hurricane, which really took out the power for quite a few months. Uh, they were able to um, get up and running in the December time frame for some really key uh, uh, observations of, a, of several particular uh, NEOs that we wanted to have them uh, uh, hit, and they did. It was uh, really spectacular. So what we've been doing is a few things in the mitigation area, in particular working with uh, FEMA, uh, doing some tabletop exercises, uh, seeing what it, uh, having them see what it's like as we learn things about an incoming NEO uh, that will impact the earth and what would be the response from a civil dis uh, defense uh, approach. Uh, we've done several of these exercises now. They've been very illuminating and, uh, and so are working with FEMA is, uh, is uh, shaping new approaches for them in terms of um, uh, uh, civil defense. What's important about the mitigation element is a new mission and it's called DART. So this is a double asteroid redirect test. Uh, it was actually part of a, a, of a two-mission element. Uh, this was uh, originally uh, pioneered by the European Space Agency. Uh, ESA was not able to create the full funding necessary, uh, but we're moving forward with our portion of it. Uh, DART is really all about moving a NEO in its trajectory and watching that orbit change. And what's really unique about this particular approach is um, we have an opportunity with a, um, uh, a binary NEO called Didymos. Uh, Didymos A is about 780 meters or so in size. Its moon is about 160 meters in size. And the concept is we will hit the moon and uh, watch the orbit evolve. Uh, this will occur on October 5th, 2022, okay? So how do I know that date? Well, Arecibo will be underneath it and we're gonna hit it with radar. And so this will enable us to watch that orbit change. We're also working with the, uh, uh, the Italian Space Agency for a small CubeSat that will go with it, that will follow up, follows up behind um, DART, and then we'll make a, uh, we'll look at the image, uh, we'll image the area of impact, also get a better idea as to the total size of the asteroid that we hit, and that will enable us to understand uh, how that kinetic impact uh, really works. So this is, a, this is a really neat first step in mitigation and allows us then, I think, to uh, go back into our, a lot of our computer codes, extend them uh, significantly, and really understand uh, how kinetic impacts can help over uh, uh, the future uh, in terms of um, uh, mitigating uh, potential impacts. I want to talk a little bit about the discovery program. Uh, what's important, of course, is, uh, uh, you know, we have two major missions moving forward. Uh, uh, Lucy going to the Trojans and Psyche uh, also. Uh, Lucy will be launched in 21, Psyche in 22. Psyche, it goes to uh, the metal asteroid, Psyche. Uh, so those are uh, in development. Uh, InSight is um, in Vandenberg right now. So that's the one we're going to launch. And, of course, um, Strophio is uh, in... Uh, uh, at ESA and integrated into their Bepi Colombo mission. And we've um, uh, selected instrumentation for uh, the uh, JAXA mission called the MMX, which is the Martian Moon's uh, exploration mission. It's really all about looking at both Phobos and Debos and returning a sample from Phobos. Uh, so those are all really exciting and the discovery program is very healthy. Now, you know, we put out an announcement uh, for when the next one's going to happen. Here's the uh, uh, basic schedule. Uh, the targeted AO was uh, September 2018. Uh, we're still on track for that. Cost cap 495, and that's A through D. Uh, this seems to be working well for us, excluding the launch vehicle. We're going to continue to do that and also excluding phase E. Uh, we announced earlier that uh, we would include radioisotope heaters, but not radioisotope power systems. Now we had a number of uh, 
uh, groups in our community, a number of our assessment groups that, that said, uh, you know, really uh, we'd like to have NASA headquarters relook at that, and indeed we did. We went back to the Department of Energy, um, had to tweak a little bit the input. Uh, had to, we had to push in certain areas, and uh, so we're announcing now that we indeed will allow up to two multi mission radioisothermal generators, two MMRTGs, okay? So as I said, we were holding back some plutonium for the lunar program, but you know, we're also getting to the point where Department of Energy is going to be putting in a much more production environment, the generation of plutonium. And uh, so the confluence of when that would happen and when these two programs would, um, uh, would really move out uh, just seemed to um, uh, come together a little bit for us that would enable us to move in this direction. Uh, this is, uh, you know, what we've been doing with the uh, Department of Energy is really enormously enabling. You have to think back about what's been happening and it's almost like we get one radioisotope power system in a decade, you know, so. So we've done uh, Curiosity in the previous decade was New Horizons, and the previous decade was Cassini, and then the previous decade was Galileo. And, and now when we look forward, we're looking forward to having it on Mars 2020, uh, potentially one of our new frontiers, uh, selected missions, a whole series of landed, uh, uh, perhaps geophysical stations, uh, other things that we would put down on the moon in terms of uh, long-lived rovers that uh, would have radioisotope power, and now also an opportunity in discovery. So uh, this is really a, a, a very important topic, and, and um, I'm delighted it ended up this way for you and the community that need it, okay? So it's still a competition. You have to win it. In the New Frontiers program, uh, New Horizons doing great, as I mentioned, is going to fly by uh, Ultima Thule in uh, January 1st. Uh, should be another uh, spectacular event. Uh, the occultations that they did this last year seem to indicate that this was a multiple object, or at least an extended one. Um, you know, 30% of the Kuiper Belt objects that seem to be observed are binaries, and this indeed may be a binary. So uh, uh, we have a, a, a lot to look forward to, a lot in store for the for this particular mission. Uh, there's also another potential occultation this summer, and we'll, we'd like to see them take advantage of that. Juno is doing absolutely spectacular. Uh, if you haven't seen some of the um, amateurs uh, using the data out of Juno Cam, you're really missing out. There's some really creative, creative images that are coming out being posted to the Juno Cam website, and uh, they're doing uh, really, uh, really engaging the community quite well with that particular approach. And as I mentioned already, Osiris Rex is doing great. We'll be looking at Bennu pretty quick and it'll only get bigger. Now in the New Frontiers 4 area, as you know, we've gone through a competition and out of this we've uh, uh, selected two missions. Those missions are going through uh, what they call uh, the Phase A concept study reports. So they're taking the input from uh, the evaluations, they're, they're looking at those, they're mitigating risks, they're coming up with uh, uh, ways that then they can improve their proposal and submit those in uh, December, and we'll go through the evaluation, and then I will announce the down select in the summer of next year. <coughs> Excuse me. The two uh, that are in competition uh, P, uh, the PI for this is Steve Squires, and it's uh, uh, the Comet Astrobiology Exploration Sample Return Mission, uh, or CSER. It's going to uh, an old friend, which is uh, Comet Churyumov Gerasimenko, uh, a fabulous comet we know probably the most about uh, because of Rosetta and what it's done, and acquire a sample and be able to return that approximately 80 grams, which will be uh, uh, spect uh, spectacular and it has certainly been important uh, in the decadal. Uh, the second mission that we've selected in this particular type of competition is called Dragonfly. Uh, the PI is a Zippy Turtle, and it's a um, uh, you know, quad uh, rotorcraft that enables uh, uh, extensive uh, uh, analysis of uh, uh, the atmosphere, and of course, uh, uh, the, the uh, chemical composition of the Titan atmosphere 
and, and the minor constituents and, and how the, how the uh, uh, atmosphere and land interact are all important. Uh, this particular uh, vehicle has an opportunity to make many hops and move to several locations and, and continue on with its uh, chemical analysis. And uh, so also pretty, uh, pretty spectacular mission. Uh, in the area of Mars, uh, let me mention, of course, InSight, again, uh, launched in 2020 uh, out of Vandenberg. Uh, we have uh, two CubeSats that are going to go with it. These are uh, what we call the Marco CubeSats. Uh, they're designed uh, to uh, uh, be relays, so as InSight enters uh, the Martian atmosphere, goes through the entry, descent, and landing uh, to get down to the surface, it will constantly uh, send tones that will indicate uh, what's happening uh, to the spacecraft and, and in its location. We want to receive those. If there's problems that occur in EDL, we need to know where it happened, at what phase, and, uh, uh, and that will enable us to understand uh, how to do the next one, uh, which, uh, which will be Mars 2020. These are all really important, critical events that have to work perfectly. And, uh, and uh, we've been a, a amazingly uh, productive in this particular area. Uh, so this is also quite important, although these are the only thing that these CubeSats do, they then fly on, go by Mars. Uh, they're sort of helping pioneer this approach in terms of uh, getting CubeSats worked into our mission scenarios. Uh, the concept behind uh, what we're moving forward with our CubeSats is really uh, to be part of upcoming planetary launches. You know, it's so hard to launch in a low Earth orbit and then get to Mars with a CubeSat, you know, right? That's, that sounds pretty difficult. Well, it is. And, uh, and so, you know, we want to take the opportunity to use planetary missions uh, to be able to get out, um, uh, out of the near-Earth environment and out to target. And so uh, uh, the Simplex call is being uh, updated. Thanks for your input on that. And, uh, Talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, of course, our next really big Mars mission uh, after InSight is Mars 2020. It's the very next opportunity. It, it goes uh, in July 2020, and, and this really is the start of sample return. It's designed to go to a, a, a geologically diverse area where there's a significant flow and evidence of water in the past, and then be able to core uh, looking at the geological records, sleeve those cores, and then those cores will be later returned uh, in a process for which we, we are working with the international community. And that, that process has uh, been talked about largely uh, in many venues. The Decadal had this basic ar architecture, and maybe that's all about uh, getting the Mars Ascent vehicle down to the surface, being able to acquire the samples and put them in the Mars Ascent vehicle, launch them, have them in orbit and then have another mission come uh, uh, into orbit or move down to the altitude of where the samples are, acquire that, uh, and then uh, break orbit and bring that back. And it has the opportunity potentially to bring it back all the way to Earth or perhaps uh, to the gateway uh, at the moon. So that overall architecture, we're working with um, uh, our international community to really help plan out uh, the, all the elements and then, and then uh, look at the assignment of who's going to do what and then begin the process of putting this um, uh, series of missions together to make this happen. In the area of ocean worlds, Europa Clipper is doing great. You know, the, um, uh, the objectives are indeed to in, uh, really look at uh, Europa, uh, uh, understanding the ice thickness, uh, really looking for the plumes, having opportunities uh, to fly through those plumes, uh, understanding how the ocean communicates with the surface uh, really uh, uh, give us our first indication uh, of how we might want to go back with high resolution imaging that will support a future lander opportunity and then make measurements of uh, uh, its uh, not only habitability with Clipper but hopefully even find life on, you know, with subsequent missions. Um, also, uh, we have a number of studies going on with the National Academy. <clears throat> Uh, the midterm is just now wrapping up, so uh, uh, believe it or not, Vision and Voyages, uh, we've gone through our first five years of that. You know, it seems longer to me, but in any event, uh, uh, we have, uh, we're halfway through it. We've got another five years to go uh, and, and a, lot to, a lot to do. 
the midterm committee is uh, going to be wrapping up, and, and uh, we believe the report is expected about the June time frame. Yeah, about the June time frame. Okay. Well, we've also initiated another uh, study. This is a sample analysis investment strategy. You know, we've in uh, over the last 10 years or so, we've invested more than $30 million out in the community for uh, enhancements in laboratory equipment for analyzing samples, and we want to continue that investment, maybe even increase it um, uh, in terms of updating the equipment. In, in fact, that's, that's not the total investment. Many of those that are selected are, all, uh, are joint with either NSF or uh, the universities that uh, many, where some of this equipment is for which uh, they provide uh, facilities, capabilities, or other things that defray the cost that makes it a cost-sharing arrangement. Uh, and so uh, as we're moving into an era, I think, this next 10 years of a lot of sample returns, not just the lunar samples. You know, we're going to be bringing back the Mars samples. We're going to be bringing back Phobos samples. We're going to be bringing back asteroid samples. And, and so that's not only Bennu, uh, but uh, uh, Hayabusa 2. Uh, we have an arrangement with JAXA on Hay Hayabusa 2 samples, and we'll acquire some a percentage of those samples for analysis. So this next decade, we just need to get ready. And uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that study has already started. They've had several meetings. And, and uh, what I'm hoping is we'll get some guidance in terms of, of uh, how to coordinate with our international partners better and in what areas that we really need to invest in and, and then begin that process of uh, instrument uh, investment out in the community and also uh, in our initial analysis teams in, in the way we approach bringing samples back and characterizing them. Uh, also then, after that, the third decadal will get kick off. So in the October 2019 timeframe, we'll be providing um, the National Academy with their charge. And um, to get ready for that, I asked the Committee on Astrobiology and Planetary Science, and that is the standing committee for uh, the National Academy for uh, our planetary uh, uh, decadal. I've asked them, what are some of the studies that we need to get ready and invest in over the next several years? Uh, that's this uh, report down in the lower right-hand corner that came out last year. And uh, these were the studies that we have done. We've, uh, we've done a lot of uh, uh, work on what, what might be the Mars next orbiter. This would be the NEMO, uh, for those that know um, uh, that terminology. We've done Uranus and Neptune, the ice giants. Uh, we've got a major study team report come, that's come out on Europa Lander. Uh, we're working with uh, the Russian Space Agency on, on uh, Venus Orbiter and Lander combinations, and that's continuing. Uh, their initial report is out. You can get access to that. And there's been a completed NEO search and characterization report also that's been completed that uh, uh, is uh, extremely important, talks about uh, how to en greatly enhance our surveys. And, and, um, uh, and so um, these are the next set of uh, prioritized uh, studies that need to be done both in Venus and lunar, Mars, uh, dwarf planets, uh, Io, Saturn system, and uh, potentially dedicated telescopes. So over the next year or so, I'm going to be working with um, uh, the team to uh, actually come up with uh, uh, a schedule, uh, and uh, we'll we'll start uh, we'll start aggressively moving through a number of these studies. Uh, we have started already another study that uh, is from the previous list, and this is to series. So this is our next predecadal study, but I think you'll see also that we'll be assigning a couple more uh, probably by this summer and get going on. So let me finish by, uh, I didn't talk much about the RNA program, uh, and John's here to answer any questions you may have. But the real important meeting relative to the RNA program will be uh, tomorrow over the noon hour. So please go to that, it's Waterway 4. Uh, now, uh, as you know, uh, of course, with our enhanced budget in RNA, uh, that means we're going to have uh, uh, more proposals to read, more opportunities available, and, and we desperately need reviewers. You know, uh, we recognize this whole effort works uh, uh, on the back of our reviewers. And we thank you for those that uh, have participated in the reviews and want to continue to encourage those. 
uh, to uh, uh, spend the time to do that. This is uh, you know, what we view as community service. Uh, it's extremely important and really moves our whole field ahead. Uh, so um, uh, I want to encourage you uh, then to volunteer, and you can do that at uh, this particular address, uh, science.nasa.gov slash researchers slash volunteer review panelists, okay? So um, uh, with that, then, uh, let me end and take any questions you have with the rest of the team. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have microphones set up in the middle of the room. And if you are going to ask a question, could you please state your name and institution ahead of time? Uh, Alfred McEwen, I think. Okay, Alfred McEwen, Arizona, and, and OPAG chair. So, uh, Jim, you mentioned you're up at Clipper. Uh, now, the, the Clipper project is working towards the 22 launch and arrives by 25 via SLS. The president's budget now has it arriving in 32 or 33. That's a seven or eight year delay. Cassini funding is going to end soon, so that's a large gap in any data from the outer solar system. So uh, this is in concert with Mars program shifting to Mars sample return, which is an expensive engineering task. So again, funding for scientists will decline. So we have two major communities with declining opportunities, and not everyone wants to study the moon. So it looks like we could have a situation wow. where the PSD budget is a Young record more. high level Young and more. yet young scientists are still struggling to, to make a career in the field. Do you think that's acceptable? And if not, what would you do about it? Okay. So, we're cer okay, so, okay. so we're certainly aware of that disconnect. You know, uh, uh, as, as we noted, we, we have moved it in for a, a particular year. There is congressional uh, direction that says, uh, yay, barely use an SLS. Um, uh, those are all in our parameter space, and we're going to continue to push on that. So um, it, uh, it, it, what, you, what you're saying is, uh, is indeed uh, there, you know, something we have to consider and work over, over time. Okay, I know you want me to do something about it right now, but we are <laughs> making progress. Just hang tight. Clive Neal, uh, University of Notre Dame, and for the next 36 hours, league chair. Um, and I would, I can't understand why you don't want to study the moon, uh, Alfred. Uh, it's sort of bizarre to me, actually. But uh, I mean, it does solar system science so well. Um, I have a question for John and probably Ben. Uh, something in your presentation was was. Well, it struck me, and that was the resource prospector. We don't really know where it fits in now. And if the gateway is using lunar resources, I thought it would fit in really well. So a clarification in terms of the future of resource prospector, um, number one, because uh, League has certainly been supporting this uh, for quite some time. I, I, and also with gateway, if it, if it is a refueling depot that could use lunar resources, you would really enhance the commercial uh, enterprise with that. And I'm not sure whether that was discussed at the Denver meeting. I had a choice, Denver or Japan. Um, so I was in Japan, so I apologize for that. But, but uh, if you could just give a clarification, because Resource Prospector is the mission that keeps on promising and never delivers. Sure. So. Um you're correct. Resource Prospector does, the science it can do does play, uh, play a great role for the future planning of human spaceflight and understanding uh, polar volatiles and other things. Uh, what I meant was um, uh, the, uh, the function of the, the Prospector, a rover, it's a, it needs a small lander. It, uh, it, I was, it was more organizational disarray where, you know, when you, you want to find out where it fits into the new strategy we've been showing up here and then where it fits in, then you have a, a, a funding line and that funding line has to compete with whatever else is there. And, and right now it's a little bit nebulous where it fits in. That's the only discrepancy. It's still good science. We still want to see it uh, move forward. We're just uh, waiting to see where it falls out, uh, organizationally speaking. But advance to, uh, to proceed 
Is that what the ATP was? Uh, authority to proceed. Authority yes. Pres yes. So is hope. So is it still 2022, or is that the notional date, or are we? We are still hopeful. Um, there is, you see, there is a lot of disarray in the organization right now, and we're just, we just want to see it through. And I was just being candid, saying, well, we're not sure where it's okay. going to fall out. All right, all right, thank you. All right, Ben, did you have something? Uh, John Christoph, Arizona State. I'd like you to clarify a little bit exactly where this extra $400 million is coming from because this point was brought up last year and it bears repeating this year. The, mo the money that goes to the planetary science doesn't exist in isolation. NASA also has education, also has earth science, and there are other agencies within the federal government which the administration has not been kind to. Uh, I would really appreciate some clarification as to how we expect the role of planetary science to continue to do all of these great things when the rest of the federal science apparatus is nearly being dismantled. So let me go. All right. So let, let me mention a couple of things. Uh, uh, you know, perhaps you weren't here during the times when um, we took a three hundred and seventy million dollar cut in one fiscal year. Okay. Um, and, and we've been working hard to get that funding back. Uh, this is um, uh, this last fiscal year, or rather the previous one, was the first one we actually got back to where we were before we had a $370 million cut. Uh, those were during times when, the, when other parts of the agency uh, were uh, being enhanced, um, and indeed uh, even other um, uh, parts of the government were, were receiving funding. Uh, this is the process we go through. Uh, there's um, uh, a variety of things that happen uh, in terms of the administration's approach, uh, the investment that they want to make in, in certain ways, and we have an opportunity to, uh, in this particular uh, administration, move forward with a, uh, with a very rigorous program of exploration, starting with the moon, but also maintaining and enhancing the other elements of our program. So it's not an either or. Uh, we, we, we recognize these things are not done in isolation. Um, uh, but um, uh, I've always urged the planetary community to concentrate on what they do best, which is planetary science, and talk about what we can do, and not talk about other parts of the program that are not ours, whether, whether they're going up or going down. Never hurts our, it never helps our community um, uh, to, um, uh, to really be critical of other, other elements in the government over that approach. We need to concentrate on what we do best and let that uh, help us uh, move forward. But there are times, indeed, when uh, the budget goes goes down, and and, and we all take uh, all take hits for that. So, if if you think we should be sad that our budget's going down, you're wrong. Sorry, going up. <laughs> yeah, that was really optimistic, wasn't it? Yeah, you're you're wrong. You know, we have a role to play. And we need to concentrate on doing that role and, and making the best of the money. Uh, the more we can do that, that enables many other things to go on. We're working hard now with the, the other science disciplines in, 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 in areas that, that cross between uh, planetary science and astrophysics and heliophysics in particular, and exoplanets and astrobiology and looking for life elsewhere. Uh, and as we do more of that, uh, uh, you know, those, those disciplines will benefit from that, too. Uh, so perhaps that uh, is the, uh, will help you uh, think about going forward. But I'm not planning to return any money to the Treasury. Okay? We're going to be good stewards of our money, and we're going to spend it the best way we can, and we're going to move this nation forward with what we do. This is really important. Uh, many of us lived through some really austere times when, when we had to make major choices on, on who in the community we'd be able to even hang on to, okay? It's now our time in the sun to shine. Let's do that, okay? 
So, briefly, I appreciate the sentiment, but speaking for myself, I would not be in this room, let alone in this community, if it were not for the space grant program funded by NASA's as Office of Education. Given this is the second budget in a row where the president has tried to cut that, I cannot be comfortable with an approach that only relies on us doing our job. Okay, Brad. Brad Bailey, NASA Sur okay, hello. Brad Bailey, NASA Survey. This question is for Deputy Director John Guidi. And in your talk, you mentioned that there was no current plan for small sats on EM2. I was wondering if you could outline AES's and HUMD's plan moving forward for small sats and cube sats. Uh, how you could potentially use them to close SKGs and whether that represents opportunities for this community. Well, the, uh, there's no plans for uh, small sats, cube sats on EM2 because it's, it's somewhat mass limited right now. We're still trying to bump up that co-manifest capability to get uh, the first parts of the gateway in place and that's our priority right now. It could show up that there's uh, mass opportunities. We, we believe in subsequent flights, uh, they'll learn a lot more about the SLS launch system and there'll be a lot more opportunities for, for small sats, cube sats. Uh, we do feel the Gateway is a venue, uh, great venue for hosting small sats, cube sats, and free flyers. So uh, I, I know that the, the opportunities are just going to increase. Today it's a, it's a little bit constrained in the, uh, the mass area to advertise any uh, capabilities. Thanks. Did you want to? Oh, no, go ahead. Okay. Uh, John Bridges, University of Leicester. Um, you mentioned your international partners several times, Jim. Uh, what role do you see international partners like ESA taking in Mars sample return, things like fetch rovers, um, 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 planetary protection, and getting the samples back to Earth? There's actually a lot of work going on in that particular area. We, we've been in constant uh, communication with several space agencies and, and uh, uh, several architectures have been discussed. Uh, there's quite a bit of work in terms of determining what each of the agencies want to do, what they're good at and how they would fit in and whether there are clean interfaces in between. Uh, in fact, um, in April, uh, there'll be a major meeting in Bern, uh, I think it's Berlin. Yeah, thank you. Berlin, I knew that wasn't right. Uh, for which that's our next major uh, multilateral discussion in this particular area. So it's, it's, it's moving quite, uh, quite well. Okay, I suppose just briefly what I was getting at, as the budget, your budget condition has improved happily, um, will that same commitment to international collaboration still be there, do you envisage? Yeah, I think we've had, uh, you know, wonderful partners. Um, we're constantly working uh, uh, with our international partners uh, in improving our program. Uh, we, we want them to work with us as well as they want us to work with them. Uh, so I don't see any, any, any decrease in our approach in, in those areas, but, but uh, uh, we've, uh, we've continued to increase it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Okay, I, I think this is a brief one. Uh, this is Bill Bodke, Southwest Research Institute. Uh, the list of, of possible lunar landings over the next few years is really impressive. It's also you know, surprising how much we can get done, but that should open up a lot of possibilities for science as well. Has there been any discussion of putting science in all these things we're gonna land on the moon? So what was the question? What was the question? I'm sorry. Okay, the question is, there are many landings on the moon according to the notional schedule that you showed earlier today. Uh, is there also a discussion of putting science on the landers that we could do oh, from oh, those absolutely. things? absolutely, yeah. Well, the first okay. thing is we're gonna have a call for instruments to be built. Okay, that's what I wanted to do. Yeah, and so, okay. you know, you'll, you'll be uh, saying these are the measurements we wanna make, uh, these are the way they fit in the decadal, this is why we wanna make them, these are the areas we wanna go to, and then we'll work with the commercial vendors to be able to, uh, you know, integrate your instrument and get it, get it on the moon. Okay. And I'm just going to say we'll take questions from the speakers that are already at the mics, and then I think we have to let these guys go for dinner. So, Steve Ruff, ASU. Uh, I think this is for Jim Green. Uh, I'm really pleased to hear NASA using rhetoric now about sample return that it's it is going to happen, not sort of possible sample return, which it was for a while. Uh, but but that budget that we saw for the coming five years clearly shows us, you know, a steep decline in Mars funding 
Um, so I guess the obvious question is how do we reconcile um, NASA's stated intent to return samples from Mars with that decreasing budget? How does that work? Yeah. So how that works is we create the program, we figure out whose elements are going to be done by what countries, where our role is, and then we complete a cost estimate, and then we begin the process of um, negotiating and working with the administration to acquire the costs that then will build the appropriate budget for which we then can execute it. So uh, you have to know we're not given money because they like us. You know, we have to be able to justify uh, what what are the elements of the program and what they cost, and then, uh, and then of course, uh, meet our commitments in that cost area in particular. So let's create the program, and then, and then, we'll, go, then we'll be able to uh, be on uh, firm ground to be able to justify what funding we need at the time. Can I follow up? That, but does that follow Mars 2020 or precede or concurrent in terms of creating this program for sample return. I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand do, you. Do, does the program to create, uh, do we create a sample return program prior to Mars 2020 rover or following the collection ah, of samples? So yeah, we're going to assume we're landing Mars 2020 safely. We're going to assume that it's going to be core and rock. And while it's on the surface doing that, we're already going to have our, our uh, budget submissions. We're already going to have international partners lined up. We're already going to know what's going to happen. So that's what I view the next several years of hard work in that particular area to be done. Uh, but we're going to assume it's going to be successful. You bet. Thanks. I think that was your question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Robert Nelson, Planetary Science Institute. Uh, I'm pleased to hear uh, this uh, 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 glowing prospect. Uh, I'm pleased to see that there is a, uh, uh, a greater effort, effort to return, uh, uh, to work back, go back to the moon. I'm also pleased to see at this meeting so many colleagues from the People's Republic of China who are representing their results from their lunar mission. Uh, nevertheless, I'm perplexed by the statement that remains in the Rose's announcement for opportunity that forbids us to propose bilateral work with China. Uh, since they are the next country to return lunar samples, uh, I would like to uh, uh, ask for some assistance, or at least for it to be noted that uh, this is not a good way to do an expanded lunar exploration program when the next country that's about to go there is something that we can't propose to work with. Uh, with regard to what my anticipated answer is from you, uh, my member of Congress is already is the first woman of Chinese-American descent to be elected to Congress, and I've already spoken to her about it. Comments from you and some help from you requested in return. So indeed, we have to follow the law, and we currently have a law that's uh, set up, and we are implementing the elements uh, of what the, what's in that law. Of course, but we're we, we hope that you'll be taking note of this, this kind of feedback and I hope that I have the sympathy of colleagues here in this, regard, in this regard. So the law does not prevent, you know, scientist to scientist to work and exchange ideas and, and participate in important and unique ways um, and really allow us to uh, blossom uh, our science worldwide. You know, this happened during the Cold War, too, uh, where we had a lot of interactions on a scientist to scientist basis with uh, Soviet colleagues at the time. So, uh, uh, you know, we, we have certain requirements at a government level, but, but, but as scientists, you're, you're, you know, you're indeed free to continue on with your scientific inquiry and research, and we want to encourage you to do that. Thank you very much. I, I just hope that we can continue this discussion and hope that we can get some support at headquarters in helping to advise Congress on how we might do this better. Thank you. Okay, so last two questions, Carol, and then Mark. Okay, um, first of all, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge uh, everyone at headquarters for their advocacy and hard work in justifying the enhanced budget um, and, and demonstrating the value of that to Congress. Uh, my question is specific to the increase in the planetary defense program 
and uh, the continuing um, wedge through the next five years. Is the intent that after the DART mission is, um, is uh, over its uh, funding hump, that there would be a new start for an infrared survey telescope? And if so, um, have you thought through the process by which you would go about that? So indeed, the wedge provides us an opportunity to enhance and continue on in the program and is clearly delineated in the, in the uh, science uh, definition team report on NEOs that's now out uh, is an infrared survey is a critical element in the next step of that. So uh, we've got uh, great input from the community through that. We know we need to enhance our survey. We know we're going to expand our ground-based facilities and assets as we continue to do that. And we, we, we've got to be able to look at uh, space-based assets as well. So DART's not the end of the only mission we're going to do in that line. Indeed, uh, a survey is just as important. In fact, um, uh, we've got a lot to do in that particular area for which we believe a space-based asset is a real critical element of it. Thank you. Okay. Mark, did you want to ask a question? You were standing up there, too. I was just going to say that Carol actually asked my question. <laughs> All right. Well, that was easy. <laughs> OK, let's Brilliant. just thank Carol. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael and Jonathan. <laughs> thank you. All right, thanks, everybody. You're gonna you're gonna get beat up tomorrow. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.